Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, again, my name's Ken Tatum. Um, I got into imaging some years ago, uh, and much like, if, I don't know if any of you were here for Kevin Quinn's presentation earlier, um, sort of like him, I, I've, I've sort of learned this up on my own uh, with, with some help from other people, but uh, I'm not by any means what I would call a super expert uh, that, you know, some, uh, in the way that some people might be. Uh, but what I have done is accumulate a lot of trial and error on what works in actually trying to be able to do imaging when your only option is really to take all your gear in your car or whatever else out to the dark site, um, set it up there, get your imaging in, pack everything up, and then bring it back. Um, it's, it's sort of been forced on me by the fact that we live in an area where we have about this much sky at the top of our uh, house, and uh, uh, our light pollution is Dulles Airport down the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's really what this is about. Um, can I just get a show of hands about how many of you have done any imaging at all? Um, okay, so that's good. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'll, I'll talk to you whatever level, but I wanted to, to get a sense of that first. So one thing I want to emphasize first is that the kind of imaging I'll be talking about is more about deep sky imaging. Kevin Quinn was talking more about planetary this morning. Um, and really the kinds of things I do are more taking pictures of nebulas and galaxies and, uh, and things like that where you're really trying to focus in on a single object. Uh, so. so just so, since I know a lot of people haven't done this before, I'll go through a little bit of an overview of both the process and uh, what I use to do it. Um, so a lot of people will talk about uh, the most important part of your system being the mount because it's the part that actually your whole scope and all your equipment have to rest on and if it's not stable enough um, then you really can't track effectively and you won't get as good an image. I'm not going to talk about that so much today because I think there's a lot of presentations on that and I also think that, that it's, it's uh, maybe a little bit overemphasized compared to some other parts of the system. So I'll talk a little bit about some more things today. But if you have questions about that, uh, please let me know. Um, I'll talk a bit about auto guiders, about cameras, about peers, about scopes, about all the other parts of this. Um, but just so that we're all on the same wavelength, the auto guider is the part that actually tells the uh, uh, the mount, how to do kind of fine tune its tracking. It tries to lock in on a star and tell it if it's getting a little bit off to the left or right or up or down, it can tell it to, to get back on track. Uh, the camera, obviously, you're collecting your images with that. Um, and your mount's really the part that just tracks the, uh, the flow of the sky as it, you know, as the Earth rotates. So, Here's a little bit of an overview of the process we go through. Um, when you're doing deep sky photography, you're not taking just a single image uh, or single photograph. Usually what you're doing is taking a whole lot of images that, that you then add together and stack up to brighten the image, to give you more signal to noise ratio, to give you a lot more of clarity in the subject that you're taking a picture of. Um, you need a lot of data to do this. Uh, you need a set of your lights, which is what I call the, the images that are actually of the object you're taking. You need your darks, which are basically, you're taking an image of nothing. You're, it's like you're covering the lens cap and you're just taking a picture of nothing, but you're taking it under the same conditions that you're taking your lights on. And that gets subtracted out from your lights and that helps you eliminate any of the noise that might be generated by your camera, by the temperature, by some of the other factors in your photograph. Uh, and that noise actually stays relatively constant at a certain temperature. So really what you're doing is you're taking a picture of just that noise. And if you can subtract that picture out from your regular picture, your regular picture will be a lot cleaner. Uh, and your flats are very similar. They basically are, are pictures of a flat white 
uh, lighted surface and that'll help you subtract out things like dust and other things that might be in your optical train um, that, that might create artifacts in your image. Then you need to put all those together and that's called calibrating them. Uh, and then you uh, take all of those different segments, say you took uh, 25 minute images, you can put all those together to make uh, you know, a single 100 minute image and that's called stacking them. And then you do processing, which is really trying to bring out the details, put your colors together, all that sort of thing. Okay. So if you're thinking portability, you might think it's all about bringing down the size of your system and bringing down the weight. But in my experience, it's really all about time. It's how long does it take you to actually get your system set up to be able to load it in your car, to be able to unload it when you're home. All of those factors really make the difference in how often you're going to get out to the field, how much time you're going to get to do imaging when you're there, and how much you enjoy the whole process along the way. Um, and so I'm going to talk a lot about tuning your system to use your time the best you can. Okay. And it's about caffeine too. If you're doing uh, late night deep sky imaging, you're going to be spending a lot of time on target and you're probably going to be in the field pretty late. This is really just a totally subjective graph that I tried to put together just to help myself make sense of how long did I really need to be in the field on a particular image and how long a shot did I need to take in order to actually really be happy with it. And from my experience, I found, just from what I liked, that the images I was taking that were around two to three hours, that was the point where I was really starting to see that you know, the, the, everything up from that, I was, I was getting, the time up to that is pretty high, steep curve. You're getting a lot of improvement all the time up to that. And then past that, you're still getting improvement, but it's maybe not as much, you know, it doesn't make as much of a difference in your image as those first few hours do. Now, beyond the 10 and a half hour range, you're really talking about, or beyond the six hour range, you're really talking about spending multiple nights working on a single image. And then you're trying to get into, you know, the sky and telescope, a pod sort of range. Um, it, it's a lot of effort on a single target. Most people don't want to do that. Uh, every once in a while, it might be worth trying it just for fun. And I said it's about time, but really it comes down to the single hour or however long it takes you that starts when you can first see Polaris in the sky. Because there is a ton of stuff you have to do at that point that you just can't do until it gets dark enough that you can actually uh, do a few things that actually need to be able to look up in the sky and identify a target and align on it or start focusing on it or that sort of thing. Um, for example, I always start with polar alignment with the polar scope on my mount. It's a little scope in the, the equatorial mount I use that shows you a little image, uh, a little picture of uh, where Polaris might line up next to a second star and that helps me tweak whether the mount needs to turn a little bit left or right, a little bit up or down. It's not perfect but it gets me close enough that I can shorten a lot of the time that it takes me to do later when it comes to really uh, honing that alignment in. One of the things that makes an enormous amount of difference in the quality of your images is how tightly you can do that polar alignment. So spending some time on this is really important. Um, obviously you have to focus your camera, you have to align some things. You, if you've got a finder scope that you're using to help you find stuff, you need to make sure that that's synced up with where your scope's pointing, otherwise you, you know, your finder scope's gonna point you somewhere that your scope isn't actually pointing. Uh, you need to uh, drift align and refine that polar alignment so it's good enough to actually take images with. You need to be able to find, if you're using a go-to mount in particular, you need to be able to sync that up and start that, and that usually involves pointing it at some stars and saying, yeah, that's actually where I'm pointing. Uh, you need to find and center whatever in 
target you actually want to take a picture of. And you want to make sure that you're framing it in such a way that you know, you're really happy, going to be happy with the result. And that's sort of an artistic decision. But it's also uh, just making sure that you're on that can be a challenge sometimes as well, because uh, that, that really can eat up some of your time. And then, of course, you have to go through all the rest of the process you need to actually make your auto guider track the star that's going to help you uh, keep the image in alignment as you're taking the picture. And that's another key part of it. But there's some ways that we can make this list a little bit shorter. Uh, for example, I have a great finder scope. It's a 10 by 60. It's got, you know, it's got a lot of uh, useful uh, information with, the, with sort of reticles on it. It's got some adjustments on how, uh, how to focus it, fine focus, and all sorts of things. It's a great finder. I never use it for imaging, never at all. Because what I have to do when I'm using that is stick an eyepiece in the scope, stick a diagonal on the scope, um, make sure that my scope is lined up to where that finder is, and that finder, every time I put it on, has to be tweaked with these little screws to make sure that it's pointing in the same place the scope is. I have a $30 towel rad. I use that all the time for imaging. And that, frankly, once it's on the scope and you've got it aligned once, you take it off, you put it in your case, you come back to the field the next time, you just stick it back on, and it's still in alignment. You never have to align it. That's one of the best decisions I've made for imaging is just to, to finally, you know, I, I have this, this really nice refractor and for a long time I said, oh, I just don't want to, you know, the, the towel rad mounts with these two kind of cheesy uh, um, foam tape things and you, you hear people talk about, oh, I just don't want to put those foam tape things on my nice telescope and I felt that way for a while but, but it makes such a difference in how fast I can get out an image that it's just worth it. Same thing with the guide scope. I moved from using a guide scope to track the stars to using off-axis guiding. It makes a big difference too. Let me, let me show you something. This is the camera I use. Um, you know, there are a lot of different cameras and they all have good things about them. This is a, um, a CCD camera made by a company called Quantum Scientific Imaging. Um, but the nice thing I like about it, and you don't have, there are other ways to do this too. If you look in here, there's this little prism at the top of it. And that prism, all it does is it picks off just enough light from the camera's field of view where it's not going to get in the way of the actual camera itself or the imaging chip and diverts it up to this auto guider here. And this auto guider is what looks through that prism and looks through the main scope and it will keep the scope on track and will actually track the stars and tell the scope what corrections it needs to make as you're taking your image. Now, they make, make off-axis guiders that are separate from cameras. Mine just happens to be built in. But the fact is that I can just attach this whole mechanism to my scope, and the auto guider's already there, the guiding's already there. I don't have to align a separate guide scope. I don't even have to carry it to the field. I don't have to set it up. And that makes you know, probably half an hour's difference in how fast I get to image. This camera, um, it's about four pounds. It's, it's, it's actually pretty light. I would say, let me see. I used to know exactly. I'd say it's, it's three or four pounds. Um, the auto guider's like nothing. It's, it's lighter than almost any eyepiece I own. Um, and so the whole thing together, this has its own built in uh, filter wheel. Um, so I've got my filters in here. I've got my. Uh, my off-axis guider, I've got my whole guiding system, um, and it's got its cooling system, and it, you know, it works real well. But, you know, there are a lot of times that's just not practical. Uh, you may already have your equipment, you may have things you like to use, uh, so there are other approaches you can take too 
that will cut some of your time out of that critical hour. You may have to do more in the long run, or it may take you a little bit longer total, um, because you may have to do a few things twice. Like if you're going to align on something on the ground and use that before it gets dark to, to help you sync up your guide scope and your main telescope, then you're going to have to focus on the ground, and then later you're going to have to refocus on the sky because um, they're not going to be the same. So you may end up doing a few things twice, but it'll still help you get stuff out of that critical hour. And once you do, this list starts looking a little bit more manageable. Um, there's some, some things you can do that will help you cut time each of these things take as well, uh, and that's useful to do too. But really, by cutting it down to this list, you can actually cut big chunks of time out of your setup and add a lot of those chunks into how much time you can actually spend doing the enjoyable stuff about imaging. Focusing is a big time sink. I used to spend forever on focusing. And the answer and the real reason is so I'd be sitting here at my laptop and have it take a picture through the camera. And then I'd have it take a series of pictures so I could look at them sequentially. I'd go over and tweak the focus a little bit. Back here, did that make a difference? Tweak the focus a bit. Back here, did that make a difference? And back here and tweak the focus a bit. The, I'd say motorizing the focuser so that I could just sit here and look at the image and say, okay, it needs to go in a little bit. It needs to go out a little bit just and make that adjustment without having to go back and forth and back and forth, that probably cut half an hour off the time that it took me to get set up and started imaging. Um, I would say if there's anything you can do to motorize it, that's a really, really great step. <clears throat> I would also say use short exposures, even if you have to focus on brighter stars, because otherwise you end up chasing the seeing um, and, you know, you see There'll be times when you're taking images and the air just wasn't still enough when you were taking it. And so you end up with um, kind of a blurred image. And you might think it's because you're out of focus, but really it's just because during that whole period of time when that image was being taken, the air itself shifted. And so your focus shifted along with it. So you really don't know whether you're in focus or not. Using shorter exposures on brighter targets uh, really can eliminate some of that. And in fact, the, uh, some of the software that does some of this automatically with the motorized focuser, they recommend that as well. And finally, just take notes. Um, if you can remember where to start from, uh, if you remember that when you're, you're setting up your system, that if you set up your focuser so that you're uh, you're racked out about 65 millimeters or 45 millimeters, and that's about where it's going to focus. You're not going to spend a lot of time trying to get to that initial point. You'll, you'll kind of know about where to start from, about where your system tends to reach focus, and you'll spend a lot less time with that as well. Okay, so polar alignment. You know, there's nothing that probably makes as much difference as in how well your system tracks as to whether you can get a good polar alignment to start with. I always say get your computer to use to help you with this. There are really two approaches that different programs use to help you. One is just like a traditional drift alignment. You're, you're, it, you know, in, the, in the old days, you would, when you were just using an eyepiece to drift align, you'd look at the sky, and if it was drifting up a certain amount, you'd know to tweak left or right. Um, the computer can actually, since you've got a camera on there, and it can do this algorithmically, it can track that for you. And it can do it probably more accurately than you can just by judging it with your eyes. So I use a program called PEMPRO that does uh, a few things, but one of them is it does this drift alignment procedure for you. And it'll tell you, it'll measure, it'll start um, tracking a star with your camera, take an image every so often and seeing where it's drifting off, average it out, and it'll tell you, you really just need to adjust it you know, clockwise two arc minutes or counterclockwise an arc minute or up um, by however much or down however much. And that'll get it there pretty fast. Another approach, which I've never used, but I, I've heard it works even faster, is 
that a, um, it'll take a picture of the sky in a couple of places and move around and take another picture. And it'll do what's called a plate solve, which is to identify um, where this image falls on a star map and use the, you know, align it to, to a set of guide stars um, and say, you know, do some math to say, it really should be pointed a little bit more this way or a little bit more that way. Um, there's one problem with that, and that is that the guide stars themselves, the most recent data comes from the year 2000. So we're now 2012, and the stars themselves have shifted a little bit relative to the Earth since then. So you kind of, if you're using that approach, you have to kind of manually say, okay, the program's putting me here, but I need to make an adjustment that's going to be about this far off from that to, to account for the distance, difference of those 12 years. Um, I haven't used that because I've always been concerned that's going to be a little bit too subjective and I'm not going to be able to actually get that accurate enough. The polar alignment routine I use that's drift alignment really works pretty effectively for me and it it's, takes maybe 20, 25 minutes all total of that, that first hour. And the final thing I've noticed is when I was imaging with red, green, blue, or, or narrow band filters, which are like hydrogen alpha on the, on the wavelengths of the, the stars and the nebulas and so forth, I would find that sometimes I'd forget and do my tracking through like the red filter. And if you track through the red filter, it takes a lot longer to do this because you can't get as clear an image, it'll lose the star sometimes because it's not bright enough. Always track through just a plain clear filter when you're trying to do your polar alignment or just plain monochrome and you'll get much better results. It's something I found that that was one of my trial and error things. Okay, and this is just because maybe I don't have the memory or I'm just not intelligent enough, but I found that one, th one thing that would happen to me is every time I'd go out imaging, I'd forget stuff that I really needed to know that I knew the last time I went out imaging, but I can't remember it this time. And it's stuff I need either to set my system up or to put some uh, value into some of the software to get it running. So what I did was I put just a plain text file in the startup folder of my laptop that I use for imaging. And it comes up whenever I boot, it just comes up and it's there and it reminds me, oh yeah, um, you've got these filters in your camera and they're in this order. There's one night I, uh, you know, I could not figure out why my color balance was so off. Um, it was because I had, you know, I'd installed the filters backwards. I had, uh, I was Im imaging on red, blue, and green instead of red, green, and blue. And, and when I processed it, it was just, wrong because it thought the, the filters were the other way around. Uh, it, it took me a while to diagnose that, but, but by taking notes and making sure you know what's where, you really can uh, save yourself a lot of time. Um, you know, enough said about that. So let's talk a little bit about cameras. Um, you know, I showed you this earlier, and this is a nice camera, but there's a lot of nice cameras. But there are a few things I think are really important if you're going to do field imaging in the field. The most two important things are you want to do monochrome. Um, you know, I know it's, it's easier to, you know, to do one-shot color, but one-shot color filters are not terribly efficient. They're, the, Filters are made by, for those, are made by uh, basically companies that are trying to sell chips to uh, like digital, consumer digital camera makers. And they're really just designed for daytime photography. If you get red, green, blue filters that are designed specially for astrophotography, they're red, green, blue, just like the red, green, blue filters that are on a digital camera. but while the red, green, blue filters on your DSLR might let 50-60% uh, of the light through that's red in the red filter, this will let 80-90% of the light through that's red, and you'll image that much faster. So the monochrome will come out a lot 
faster for you. You'll collect data a lot faster. Now, I've done some great imaging with DSLRs, and I, I think it's a great way to get started, so I don't knock that at all. But if you're really trying to squeeze how much time you can out of a single night, uh, go monochrome. It'll, it'll make a big difference for you. The other thing that is extremely, extremely important is regulated cooling. Um, all of these CCD chips make a lot of digital noise that, uh, that interferes with how much data you can pull out of uh, any given amount of time you're imaging. Cooling them cuts that down because a certain portion of the noise is directly proportional to the temperature that you're imaging at. Uh, it, there's, there's noise that it's called thermal noise and it actually uh, accumulates over time based on the temperature. So a lot of cameras are cooled um, and that, that cuts it way down. The trick is to calibrate that noise out effectively. You have to take dark frames. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. You know, you're basically covering the lens cap. You don't have to take those the same night. You don't even have to take those at night at all. But you do have to take them at exactly the same temperature as you took your lights or your calibration won't work. So if you have a system that has a cooling on it that's regulated where it's got a thermostat in it and it'll try and keep it at a certain temperature, then you can come along a different day or different time and take dark frames at the same temperature even you know, when you're not even set up to do imaging or you're not even out in the field and you can just use that data. And you can store um, you know, like five, 10 hours worth of, uh, of calibration data that you've taken and just use it over and over for images you take at the same temperature. That, that is a big, big factor. And I think it's one of the most important things in choosing a camera for this kind of work. That's a huge time saver, I do DSLR. Yeah. Exactly. Because you've got to take them right after or right before. Exactly, because the, the temperature has to be the same. But all you really have to do is cool, and you know, that, that's, that was probably the biggest advance for me from DSLRs to CCDs. It wasn't, you know, the fancy chip. It wasn't a lot of things. It's, it's the regulated cooling, and it's just exactly what you're talking about. You've got that catalog of this is five minutes of this temperature, this is yeah. And there are all going to be other factors, too, that you want to look at as well. Um, if you can connect everything up with a couple of USB cables and a power cable, um, that's going to be great. If you have like three or four ribbon cables that look like the inside of your computer and you, and you got to kind of screw those on and then you got to connect that to a serial to USB adapter and some other things. Like yeah, that, that may be a little bit trickier. Um, those are really more subjective, but they make a difference in how long it takes you to get set up and, and how convenient it is and how much you're going to enjoy it. And frankly, look at who's got good drivers and, and stuff like that because it, you can be really frustrated out in the field when you can't get your software to work or uh, you can't get your driver for your camera to be compatible with your driver for your auto guider or your driver for your focuser or whatever else. I've been through that a few times, um, but I think these days it's starting to stabilize out, at least with most of the, the big manufacturers. So we've talked a bit about how to use your time in the field, but there's also a bit about how do you make your setup and takedown easier. Um, you know, I said it's, it's about time, but sometimes it really is about size. Uh, if you're just starting out, I would think seriously about starting with a pretty small refractor, something with, that's, uh, that's almost like a camera lens, but a little bit bigger, uh, you know, like a 500 to 700 millimeter focal length, because that short focal length won't put a lot of strain on a mount. You can go with a pretty small mount, um, and you'll get pretty accurate tracking at that level uh, without uh, without having to do a whole lot of tweaking, um, and it'll just be a lot more forgiving. Uh, I would go with something that's got a fast focal ratio, like F5 or F6, F7, somewhere in there, that 
lets you, uh, because you'll collect light faster, it's just like, a, like with a camera lens, if you're, you set your, your aperture to, uh, you know, to f4, f5, or f2.8, or whatever, you'll, it'll be a much brighter image than if you set it to f16. Um, there is some technical debate about whether it makes a difference on telescopes or not. I'm not going to go there. I, I think it does, um, and I, it, my experience says it does. Um, but like an 80 to 100 millimeter refractor, really you can do a lot of things with imaging wise. Now the trade-off is mainly galaxies. If you're going to do small galaxies, you need long focal length, and there's no way about it. Otherwise, you're going to take an image of a whole bunch of star field and there's going to be a little bit of galaxy in the middle of it. Um, but there's a whole lot of targets. And, and there are even some pretty big galaxies, you know, M33. M there's a lot of galaxies that actually do um, well with wide field. Um, and there's a lot of other targets, especially nebulas, that do well with wide field. So I think it's a great way to start. Now, let me talk a little bit about laptops. I think personally that a really cheap laptop that you can afford to dedicate just to your imaging is much better than a big fancy laptop that could do everything for you. Um, and that's because you can just, you know, you don't have to worry that some piece of software you installed for your business or whatever else is going to impact your drivers for your auto guider and you're going to get out in the field and suddenly something's not going to work for you anymore. Um, I've had stuff like that happen. Um, I really don't, you know, it, it's not enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> but you can also do other stuff. You can tape up all the lights on it so that they're all red and you don't get funny looks when you take it to a conference. Um, you, can, uh, you can have you, you can set it up so that it just boots up and it has that, that notepad file for you that has all your astrophotography stuff right on your desktop. It's got all your icons there for you that's, that's customized just for what you want to do with imaging and nothing else. Uh, it just makes it a, a better experience. If you can't do that, I recommend at least setting up um, a dedicated account, like log in as a different user for your auto guiding and try and set it up that way so that you've got all your imaging stuff there and that can, that can go a long ways towards that. Um, okay, so I use Max for a lot of things. I don't recommend that for imaging. Um, there's, uh, the, the exception is planetary. You can do some great stuff with planetary for that. But for, for deep sky imaging, the real problem is there is no polar alignment software made for a Mac that I've been able to find, none. Um, and if you try and do dual boot or some of those things, I found the Macs don't, in the Windows mode, don't have the same kind of power efficiency they do when they're operating in, in OS X. Uh, it's a downside, I don't like it, but the fact is so many things, the drivers just work real well in Windows 7, 64-bit now, that that's a good standard to stick with. Um, I'd be real hesitant when Windows 8 comes out about moving to that for a long time because I expect it will be, it will be years before all the manufacturers get their drivers updated to work properly on it. Are you even on 7 yet? Yeah, I'm on 7. I stuck with XP for a long time. But nowadays, Windows 7 64-bit, most things are pretty stable with it. Um, I, I haven't, I have yet to find something that I'm using that isn't, isn't working with it. Um, it works really well. Well, plus you also meant to mention cheap. Yes. Mac laptops are not cheap. Right? Well, that's true. Well, that's true. The, um, but the other, thing that was, the, the other thing that's good about cheap laptops is they tend to be kind of low powered. They had, tend to have little, uh, like, you know, like a really, hardly any graphics acceleration. And what that does for you, there's a benefit in that for imaging, and that is they tend to have less power consumption. And the less power consumption you have from your, your laptop, the less you know, sets of um, you know, 100 pound 12 volt batteries you're gonna have to lug out to the field. Because um, actually your, your laptops can be one of the big power drains on your whole system. A lot of the astrophotography equipment is designed to be pretty low power consumption. A lot of laptops aren't. 
So. They're, they're an advantage of a cheap laptop is if they do take the test of it. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. Laptops. That's a good point. <laughs> so I said I'm not going to talk much about mounts, but I am going to talk a bit about the tripods that you put on them on. Um, I've got one that I don't think is made anymore that's actually uh, pretty nice and it was, it was fairly expensive, but, but there are a lot of them now that can actually help your setup time um, in how much you have to actually do getting out to the field. Um, for example, if it's got better provisions on it for leveling, you need to get things pretty level for, otherwise when you're doing your polar alignment, um, your, when you do your azimuth alignment, that can have an impact on your altitude, and when you do your altitude alignment, that can have an impact on your azimuth if you're not, if you're not level. Um, so you really want to do that early, and some of them have some kind of fine adjusters on the feet that can help you do that. And another thing that some of them do now that's pretty useful is being able to um, rotate around beyond just the little adjustment range that your mount might have in azimuth. So if you set up your system and you get your polar scope out and you're all ready and you figure out that I to get this properly aligned, I really need to be a degree more to the left than I've got range to adjust. You don't have to pick everything up, turn it physically and move it. You can loosen some bolts and, and turn it. And that's a big, big feature if you can find that on something. Um, I've heard there's a guy out, uh, you know, I was, I was hoping to, uh, to see one of them, but I know, because I know one of the people in Novak has one, but I've heard there's a, a, a company that started making some like this, uh, Rob Miller, and you know, I think he's like a single proprietor, but the, you can get some that are really light and really portable, but also really sturdy. And if you can do that, the base that your mount is mounted on can actually make a lighter mount perform more stably. Um, I had, for a long time, and I still have it, um, a Los Mandy GM8. It's a lightweight mount. Um, it's got the whole tripod with it and everything. The mount's actually pretty good, pretty capable, but the tripod, not so great. It's pretty shaky. Um, a lot of people use it with the tripod for its big brother, the, the Los Mandy G11. Um, that can be work out to be a better combination because you end up with a good weight to uh, carry balance, but uh, but the tripod, but it'll act like a heavier mount because the uh, uh, the gears and everything that they're resting on is stable enough that that part's not going to be shaking. So it's just going to be the movement of the mount that it has to worry about. Okay. Equipment cases, it goes without saying, that's going to make a difference in how hard it is, but there's some different strategies. There's some strategies of, do you want to carry bigger cases and carry more stuff together? Um, do you feel comfortable carrying that kind of weight? Or do you want things in uh, littler loads and, in, you know, and, and individually packed? Um, can you do things modular so that when you're going out to do imaging, you don't have to carry with you all the stuff you need to do visual observing and vice versa? Um, these are things that I found over time, I think, really help make it, make your imaging setup not, it's not, never going to be grab and go, but it's closer to that realm. So packing things together, some things just make logical sense if you can do it. If you can pack your scope with the rings it mounts in and the dovetail plate you need to attach it to your mount, that's a great thing. My larger telescope, I can't because if I do that, it gets too heavy. I mean, the rings are, are themselves a few pounds, the dovetail plates a few pounds. But um, my wife's smaller scope, which this is a picture of, they, it works perfectly to do that. So it's just a trade-off of, of what can you carry versus uh, uh, what really, you know, what, how much time do you have to spend porting different things around. If you can pack assemblies of stuff, now this one's already, my camera's already still, uh, the, it's got its own off-axis guider and things like that, but even if you had an external guider, off-axis guider, you might be able to find a case where you could pack the whole assembly of your, your off-axis guider, your auto guider, and your camera, and by being able to do that and just take the whole thing off and assemble it to 
your telescope, you might save yourself 15 or 20 minutes each time you go out. Um, and that's never going to be too heavy because that whole system is designed to be riding up and down on, on your telescope and on your mount and everything else. So then there's the strategy of just never unload it at all when you get home. Um, okay, so I've got 45 pounds of counterweights on my big system. And I've got probably in the, the, the counterweight shaft is probably another eight or 10 pounds. These things are big blocks of stainless steel. I'm not too worried about them staying in the car. Um, I, I'll wrap them up, sure, but, but I'm not gonna, every time I go home, I'm not going to take that, that 50 pounds, of, you know, 50, 60 pounds of stuff, take it into the house, then the next time I wanna go out imaging, carry it back out to the car. That saves me a lot of strain every time I go out. And in fact, I've got in the back of our, our car, we've got, um, you know, like there's a, a place kind of by where the, uh, behind where the, the spare tire area is, where it's got sort of like a little storage tray that's under the, the trunk area. I actually cut out some foam inserts for that and use that as the storage case for my counterweights and counterweight shafts so that those just fit into the car and, and that's actually, uh, that goes with me everywhere. It probably cuts down my gas mileage a little bit, but I get out imaging a lot more because of that. Um, I keep a folding chairs and tables in the car. Um, I've heard of people that will keep their 12 volt batteries in the car, use a long cable, uh, so when they take their, their system out, they've got long cables that'll, that'll attach their batteries to their system, so they never even unload them from their car. Then when they get home, they'll, uh, they'll take the cables and plug it into their charger and just leave their batteries in their car. I mean, their car batteries for the most part, I mean, they're, you know, they sit out in the garage, all the time, or they're marine deep cycle batteries, so it's not necessarily going to kill them. But sometimes, yeah. But but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to think about how can you make your system a lot more of a system that when you get home from work and it looks like the sky's good, you can actually have time to go out and image. But sometimes there's not going to be enough time and. You know, sometimes the sky is not going to cooperate, and sometimes you need just some strategies to try and get past that. Um, there are two things I've done from time to time. One is just black and white imaging. Um, you will collect data on your luminance, or um, what sometimes I do is called hydrogen alpha. It's a narrow band filter, but just it's, it's one of the ones that collects data pretty fast. You'll collect that data a lot faster than you will if you're trying to do that plus your different colors to make a color image. Um, you know, I would say on this, this image on the left, which, you know, you can see it, that's, these are not terribly bright because we're in a, in a, a bright room in the projector, but, but they actually look pretty decent. That's about two hours, that's maybe two hours worth of um, what ended up being probably a 10 and 10 and a half hour image. Um, and a lot of it was the color because uh, the color just took forever to develop on the Pelican Nebula when you're shooting in narrow band, which is one of the things I like to do. Um, but, but the black and white was really fast and it came out to be a really good image. Another thing you can do is a lot of cameras will let you, say you've got a four megapixel camera, it's got like 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels. You can bend them to a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels. So every four pixels, it treats it as like a single pixel and it gathers four times as much light. You know, you've got only a quarter of the resolution. So what can you do about that? You can take your luminance or your black and white or a detail image in black and white at the full resolution and then you can take your colors bin two by two and process the whole thing together you know, and, and then you can kind of cheat and get the effect of the colors on it so that those, you're using those, those lower resolution color images to colorize your detailed um, black and white image. And you get not quite completely as good, but it really does work really well. And that's what I did on this, this right hand image of the, uh, what's called the wall in uh, the North American Nebula. 
um, it actually works and it'll save you a lot of time because your colors then will be gathering light four times as fast as they would normally. That's, that can save you just, just tons of time. Um, Is binning usually done in the setting of the camera? Yeah, your camera has to be able to do it. Um, I've heard of people trying it offline, like you know, taking the 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 Im taking the image um, at full resolution and then kind of manually binning it together. It might or might not. I don't know, understand the math well enough to understand exactly whether that works or not. It's more of a noise reduction technique when you're doing it in post processing. Than yeah. Well, that's good to know. I, I, you know, I've always kind of wondered about that a little bit. I know you're, there is a certain amount where, like, um, certainly you've got the read noise from each pixel, four times as much read noise when you're doing it four versus if, you're, if it's able to treat it as one. But whether the thermal noise or the things that some of the other components can add together and you can, you can, you can improve it that way. I, you know, I, I think you're right. I think it's like a noise reduction technique. But I, you may get some benefit out of it. I, I wouldn't say it's not worth trying, at least. The only, the only thing which wouldn't work in post-processing is if the gamma isn't one. As long as you have a raw image with a gamma of one, it shouldn't matter where you add it. And you don't actually reduce the read noise because the camera has to read out each pixel. It adds it immediately, but it can't read two pixels. I, I, I know of no CCD okay. that actually can read multiple charge packets at one time. And for noise reduction, I mean, it wouldn't matter whether it's at the, the front end or the back. But he's talking about the performance improvement you get by you know, reading all the data. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's good because that's the part of the math of that I've never really completely <laughs> understood. I've never tried to do binning two by two or yeah. three by three if offline. If the gamma's not one, then all kinds of squirrely things can happen. Okay, well, each, th there you go. Each one has been added, has been built up nonlinearly and they don't combine right. The brightest one will dominate even if the brightest one has noise in it. Okay, great. No, no, that's good. Um, so yeah, I mean, it seems like maybe it is possible to do some of that in, in post-processing. Um, and if you can, that may save you a lot of time. Um, so, so that's kind of the bulk of this, but I know, you know maybe there's some questions that people want to address or anything else. So if you, if you would like, I'd be glad to, yeah. Yeah, luminance is just the gray, like the, the black and white gray scale channel of, of that. So a lot of times you'll, you'll, um, you can take images a couple of ways. You can take just through the red, green, and blue, uh, and that'll combine. But you can also take a luminous channel, which is just like through a clear filter. Maybe it's blocking infrared light so that you don't have uh, um, that kind of a, that can affect your focus, but it's basically clear, and you're just doing a black and white image, and you you sometimes, in fact, this is a really popular technique is you take most of your data in luminance, and then you take some of your data in the color channels, and then you use the color combined um, to bring all of that together and use those color channels just to colorize your your luminance image. This and make it pop. Yeah. It gives you the bright and dark details in and, nebulous. In fact, if you go on the Novak site and you go through just the member images section that they've posted, you'll see a lot of times people in various places, people make notes about this was so much time through luminance filter plus so much time through red, green, or blue, or whatever else. Um, and it, it actually works really well. Um, but, it, but basically, it's just your grayscale channel. And if you go to Photoshop or something like that, um, you'll see there, it'll talk about luminance in the same kind of way, even if you're just working with an image from uh, a DSLR or like a point and shoot digital camera. I think one, one way to look at it is, uh, I think uh, when you think about RGB, what you're really saying is you're focusing on the color stuff in two different bands, and then how bright the stuff is a sort of a consequence, a, and after a, a result of that uh, information gathered, right? When you do the luminance, think about it, trying to say what your main piece of data is, how bright it is, and then what becomes sort of secondary to some extent is 
you know, what, what color it is. But it's more important in some way, in many, many ways it's more important how bright it is than, you know, whether it's true more red or more If you're working in Photoshop, I mean, RGB is just one color space. It's one way of representing color. Uh, if you're working in, in uh, Photoshop, there is a uh, color space or a mode called lab color or LAB. It's a luminous A and B channel. A and B are basically picking a point on a um, in, in color space, and then the luminance channel is how bright it is. So you can change from RGB uh, over to what we call lab color uh, to, to play with the luminance channel directly, and then when you're done, flip it back to RGB. And that's a pretty common technique. Yeah. And, and frankly, and there's a lot of the image processing stuff that's designed specifically for astrophotography um, that'll, that'll tend to talk about things in LRGB, so luminance, red, green, and blue. Um, one of the ones I use a lot is called uh, PixInsight. Um, it's not the easiest program to use by a long shot, but you pay for it once and then you get all the updates from the future for free. Um, and if you switch platforms between PCs and Macs and things like that, um, it's just one license you, you can use it across all of it. And it has some incredibly powerful processing that you can do uh, with uh, just by learning how to use some of the, the like the, the macros and the, the uh, scripts that it's got. Even if you don't learn how to use the full power of it, um, it works pretty well. The question of the shooting the flats, I understand. Mm -hmm. Do you have to shoot them at the same temperature? Just like okay, the, the flats are a little bit more finicky. You don't, the temperature isn't, isn't the same deal, but what you have to do with the flats, you have to shoot those through the system set up just like it is for your lights. Um, and the reason is, you're basically, what you're trying to do is map out like how, was, how were the dust particles in your system aligned to the camera at the time you took it? So if you, if you take off your camera and put it back on, they won't be aligned in the same place. Um, if you do something else, they, you know, they, like, they won't be aligned. That, that's really what you're trying to map with that. You so, have to have the same focus. Focus. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, no, you don't have to have the, In fact, you take your flats out of focus, usually. Um, with it. So, really? Question is, how do you shoot your flats and use secondary? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're, you're absolutely right. I'm, I, you know, yeah, some, some <laughs> brain misfire or something like that. Um, yeah, you have to have pretty much everything the same to be able to take your flats. Um, the problem is, um, but I mean, well, it's not a problem. The thing is, your flats don't take up much time. Like, you, you usually use some kind of a light source or you put a t-shirt or flat, you know, flat white cloth over your telescope okay. uh, and, you know, and, and, and do the, the sky behind it or whatever before it gets dark. Um, and you're only talking about like 10th of a second images. You want maybe 10 or 12 of them through each filter, okay. um, but you're not talking about like... Suppose uh, the time doesn't have to match the time of your photo. Your yeah. No, it's not like darks. I mean, darks. You want the five minutes to match your five minutes. Or, or you okay. can, or you may want like twenty minutes in a bias frame that can scale it. But you, but for your flats, you're just talking about a little amount of time. So I, you know, I, to me, that's that's not like the big time component in what you're trying to do. So right. Do, do you do you take those uh, a daytime thing? Um, I don't personally. Because I have like a um, a uh, like a flat fielding device I put on the front of the telescope and it it, it illuminates it evenly gives me a nice flat right. even oh, surface. Sorry, you could just I mean you shoot a flashlight or something to the telescope in the middle of the night. And yeah, I, the only thing is you want you want a perfectly evenly illuminated. Exactly. Field, right? You don't want gradients. So exactly. you need whatever you're like shooting for the flat. Or whatever. Yeah, you can. Okay, there's a t-shirt. I mean, there's yeah. In fact, I think the the, the telegismos people were selling like t-shirts for taking flats, and then you want to take a, you know pointed at sources at a point of the sky that's like pretty evenly illuminated. You you just don't want to ha introduce anything that's gonna gonna throw off that processing of uh, of uh, um, like you know, it's darker in one place and lighter than another right. when your real image is not gonna be that way. You want it to be the same. You do want the flat to be out of focus. You, you don't want any chance that you image that. Yeah, which is generating <laughs> right. the flat. So yeah, right. 
if it's a t-shirt or a piece of white yes, yes. Or something. that's what I was trying to say yeah. earlier but I just said it possible. wrong Jim, you the front, front face of your telescope there's yeah. pretty little there's low likelihood that you'll be able to get it in focus so yes right. okay. yeah it's not if you're if you if you've got something that's two inches in front of your your lens is not going to be the same focus as the galaxy. Right, right, right. Right. Which is the focus that you're going to want to yeah. rise that you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was watching yeah. the national, I was worried about it. Yeah. I mean, what I've done, and I don't know, I'd love to hear if somebody else has a better way to do this. I shoot DSLR with camera lenses on an Astro track. So do t shirt, hold it on with rubber bands. But I wait until I can find the first star bright enough to focus on. Mm -hmm. Then I tape the focus ring down, wow. put the rubber band on, point it at some place in the twilight sky, so I can still get those flats when there's enough illumination that I don't have to do 15 second exposures. But it's like you have to be in focus, but you got to find a star to focus on, and then you've only got a little bit of light to get the. Uh, is yeah. there a better way other than buying an illuminated panel? It doesn't have to be in focus. You want to have the same relationship between the camera and the filters immediately in front of it. Any piece of glass in front of it. Yeah. But don't you want and to do to some extent the secondary. It actually can matter in the sense though that I mean you've got optical components moving around in your lens as you, you focus it. If you uh, you know, right. if, if especially you have with it, the camera, uh, if you're if you have it focused someplace other than, uh, and I've run into this, if you have it focused someplace other than infinity when you take your flats, you'll get, you know, like for example, the, you know, the natural vignette you get right. with the uh, lens system will be a little bit different. Yeah, you, want to, you want to leave it the same as what you but do. Right. That's, that's, that's right. what he's that's 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 saying. That's what he's focusing. That's yeah. But he same. needs to get it focused to the stars initially right. before he tries to take the flats. Otherwise, he's not got the same focus. Yeah. Well, well, you have to take them in the morning twilight. What you might be able to do, up. though, is just just focus on you know get, get focus on anything you know more or less at infinity. You know, just point a building yeah, that's far away or something. I mean, the you know whatever change in optical configuration in the, in the lens between that and, yeah. and the stars is going to be really really slight. But, okay. So so the problem with the DSLR is that when you change the focus, you're actually rotating the glass. That's what I was saying. When you're when you're sometimes doing this, sometimes it's just rotating. Sometimes it's just wrapping it out. But in any case, the optical configuration within the tube is changing. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to say most of uh, most of my experience involves taking images through refractors, yeah. so yeah. not not specifically lenses, yeah. and there are, there are some different challenges that involve. Is it I was still light enough that you could actually use a white light to help you eliminate the t-shirt? I've, I've read some folks use uh, illuminated panels. There's uh, some I forget the name of them, and and basically make a little box that goes over the camera lens. You could, could do them in the middle of the night as long as you sealed it enough right. to take anybody Are off. you putting filters or anything like that in front of your uh, your lens or are you just using the wrong lens? Then, I mean, your optical configuration really isn't changing in any significant way there, so you could most likely use the same flats over and over and over again. Um, no, well the problem with that is you accumulate so. dust on the filters just on the over time. Yeah, exactly. Even if you're not using filters, your lens has a different configuration of dust from one day to the next. At least and, mine did. And the other <laughs> thing is, your, your, your camera can be uh, slightly yeah, rotated yeah, with respect to your uh, primary lens from where it was last time. Especially if you change and, your and lens. And that can be a problem, yeah. too. So do you need to map out how many hours you're going to actually need to shoot a particular thing so that and you can plan for that way so that you know how long each shot has to be? Um, well, some things it's just getting as long as you can, <laughs> uh, and some things it, it, you know that that you need a lot of time on. Okay, one of the things I do a lot is called uh, narrowband imaging. I, instead of shooting through red, green, and blue filters, I shoot through. Some, a lot of times I'll shoot through filters that are the wavelength of hydrogen alpha, wavelength of oxygen three, just like if you've got an oxygen three filter on your lens, and. Uh, What's the other one? Uh, I think it's uh, sulfur, sulfur two. Yeah, and those are, and and if you've seen the like some of the false color images from the Hubble, it's the same set of color bands that they use when they're preparing those. Um, but what it does for me is, you can shoot through more light pollution, and because you're only, it's like it's like any light pollution filter, you're you're looking at very specific wavelengths of light, and other things don't matter to it. But there's a lot of interesting detail and interesting color variations that you can see in certain things that you can't in red, green, and blue. There are a lot of nebulas that basically just look red 
if you're looking at it in red, green, blue, but if you look at it in the different color wavelengths, there's really a lot of variation in them. And I like that. Um, the challenges, those kind of images take hours more um, to, to, of light gathering to actually do properly. And I'm probably a little bit insane trying to do that when I have to carry it out to the field every time and set it up and then take it down. But, uh, but it's something I've been really interested in, so, so I've tried it a lot. And that's really one of the things that's pushed me to be as efficient as possible about um, how do I do this kind of field portable mode. When you're doing narrow band, what is your focusing strategy? Because of the fact that it takes a long time to light, that's kind of a challenge. Okay. I, my focusing strategy, fortunately, my luminance, I, I have a set of Astrodon uh, narrow band filters and an Astrodon luminance filter. And my system is F8. And at that level, they're parfocal. So I'm able to focus on the luminance filter real fast and then just switch to my narrow bands. I have tried it individually too. Um, again, it, it just takes time. I mean, it takes so much more time. Um, I found I haven't gotten better results doing it that way than I have collecting more data and just uh, trying to work it through luminance. But and the flaps would be <laughs> critical for the narrow band. Yeah. Because you get clear diffraction patterns around dust yeah. because it is narrow band and not smooth out at all. Yeah, there's just so you have to keep everything exactly the same for the flats. The flats are usually the last thing you do. Yeah, I mean, I found okay. So here's another thing: is doing this, I end up a lot of times being the last person on a field. So I can take my flats, and I don't have to worry about the white light they generate because there's just no one else there left. I'm the last person there in the morning. He's come home with four or five. So. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, if you end up not having whites available, because the flats is a, yeah, the flats, um, are you going to get up some garbage or are you just going to No, get well, I mean, so I, I was for a while, it can be that way, but the other thing, when I didn't have a good system for taking flats, I was, um, before I went out, I would open up the camera and take like some really fine care, you know, like won't damage anything. Uh, cleaning solution, cleaning cloths, and making sure I got as much dust as I could off of the off of the filters um, before I went out to the field, um, and that that made a big difference um, on it. Uh, it's you know it, it was, uh, but it was it, I mean that was another step for me. I think flat doing being able to do flats um, cuts down some of that time for you mm -hmm. too. If you're going to try and do that with a DSLR particularly the Canons, I don't know about the Nikons, turn off the automatic sensor cleaning. Because what that does turn is it it, turn it off. Okay. It will move the dust the around. The and if you've got it yeah. set to automatically clean it, it's going to shake it to clean it, isn't it? I think yeah. it either shakes it or it moves a, an electrostatic charge across the It's, it's ultrasonic. It vibrates it fast to shake the oh, dust off. Is that what it does? Yeah. It'll move the dust around every yeah. single time you turn the camera on. I, I'd forgotten about that when I used to <laughs> wow. use DSLRs. Yeah. The other thing that you might want to mention is I know one of the other things you do is very carefully map out where the object's going to be. You try to find an object that's going to be crossing the meridian so that you don't have to deal with a meridian flip as much. Yeah, I try and, and I do try and plan you some of your, trips. Some more time on target without having to worry about the meridian flips and without having to, you can get it all the way down to the horizon at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I, a lot of times I'll spend a lot of time with a planetarium program, like the sky or something else, and figure out um, it's not so much that I'll choose targets based on, I'll, I'll figure out how much time I need for a target. A lot of times it's, I'll look at what night's clear and figure out what I can shoot that night and go after that. So. Any other yeah, questions? Maybe plan in advance for you, you know, really plan in advance when you want to get, so you don't go on the field and say, okay, now, okay, now what do I do, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, um, it takes a lot of pre-planning. Yeah, yeah, pre the software, the computer, you know. When you're doing visual, you can yeah. do that to some degree, but when you're trying to take as much time as you can with your imaging setup, it's... Yeah, so I, I mean, I, so I, there is a lot of like pre-planning. And in fact, there's a lot of pre-planning when I was choosing a camera, because I, I spent just hours going through, uh, okay, I've, I know what my, you know, I've got this scope, and I've got this size of chip, um, and it's gonna be, you know, it's at this focal ratio, 
what range of targets am I going to get good framing on? And is this a good buy for me to be able to get that kind of range of targets for me? And, and so I said, okay, I'll go with this particular one. But that's another strategy. There's a lot of programs out there that will help you figure out how big an image are you going to get um, with a particular scope and a particular camera. And, and sometimes going through that in advance can help you on, on purchasing decisions too. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, very thank much. you all. That was probably some of the most helpful astrophotography advice I've ever got. You well, know, you know, I started this because when I got into astrophotography, I'd pick up books about, okay, how do I get into this? And it's like, right. astrophotography from your own backyard. I can't do this from my backyard. This advice <laughs> doesn't work. So, you know, I just started having to learn this stuff on my own, and, uh, and that's where I ended up.